take a moment and just be grateful. There's a sweet presence of the Lord in this room. Just respond to it for about 10 seconds and be grateful from your heart and maybe from your lips and tell him, thank you for not giving up on me, Lord. Thank you for not giving up on me even when I gave up on myself. Your goodness and mercy. The Bible tells you it would follow you all the days of your life. You don't have an option once you come encounter with him, goodness and mercy, until the day he decides to take you up. You're leaving a remnant of goodness and mercy behind you. And the scripture also says, if God before us, who can be against us? So you are sandwiched in between God and goodness and mercy behind you. That encourages my soul this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I don't want to have you keep doing gymnastics for Jesus. So I know you've been standing for a while. Um, if you're new here, we've been giving pledges to our recently purchased building this month. We've had some amazing work days and we have grown closer together as a church family. But this is where we are at in our giving. So thank you for being faithful to your commitment to God and the house of God. And we're doing great things. God's with us. God's helping, helping us. He's He's strengthening us, giving us wisdom as we make decisions along the way. But thank you for being committed and dedicated to what God laid on your heart a couple weeks ago. So if you are new here, that is for our new building fund that we purchased in Marietta, which we hope you come back before then, but we will keep you updated as to when we will be worshiping there. I do have scripture today, but it is kind of allotted and is later in my, in my message here. So as you're seated, if you could just close your eyes and bow your heads with me. God, we thank you for the presence of God that we already feel. You are here. This is your house, and you have made it known that you are here and available for us. Speak to us today, God. Give us clarity of mind. Open our hearts, our spirits, so that we can receive the word of God. Not the word of man, but the word of God today. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody say amen. amen. We are wrapping up our three-week series. If you have been with us the last couple weeks... Um, and I'm t wrapping it up today with the title of God's Anointed. Before I get into that, I do want to give honor to my gym family. I have some up here and her family, and I have Rick back there. So thank you for being with us today. That's my little gym family. So they, they hear all about you guys, but they don't know your face and your name, so it's fine. I'm just kidding. All right, so I remember I'm talking about God's Anointed, and, and we live in a generation where we snap a picture, we upload it, we filter it, we crop it, we edit it till honestly sometimes it doesn't even look like the real moment. But when I grew up, and I'm not that old despite how I may look or what you may think, I'm not that old, but I remember we used to buy rolls of film. You probably can't see this way back there if you're older than I am, no, I'm kidding. But rolls of film that you would actually put in the camera yourself. Does anybody remember that? Yeah. Didn't you just feel like you were all, like I was so high tech, I was taking out the little you know, thing, putting it in there. And then you would take this little roll, you would take it all the way to Walgreens or CVS or Rite Aid or whatever was there at the time, you would put it in an envelope, you would seal the envelope, put all your information, and then you would begin to fast and pray that it was not just shoes of everybody or that it wasn't an arm or that your finger didn't get into the lens or that your eyes weren't red from the actual flash that took. Does anybody remember that? But there was a process that had to take place for this film to be developed. It had to go into a dark room so that the photos could develop properly. But if you opened up the dark room prematurely or you began to let light in prematurely, the light would expose the negative and the image in the negative would mess up and the images would be ruined. Many of us, because of the day we live in, we think our destiny or our ministry or our calling or our anointing is a snap and upload. We come to a conference, we go to a church service, we get a word from God and we expect it to happen right away. See, we snap it and we upload it in our mind and we say, hey, see what God's doing in my life. See what God told me. See what, how God's using me. And we wait for people to discover us. But I've come to tell you this morning, you don't need to be discovered. You need to be developed. And most of us do not allow God to develop us because we are waiting on men to discover us. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. If men discover you, men will destroy you. 
So if you allow God to develop you, he makes sure that the light that is in you is greater than the light that will ever be on you. Are you tracking with me this morning? So we have this generation going into a dark room, opening up the doors, letting light in, pulling the blinds back and destroying what God is doing. And then some of us sit here this morning and we wonder why we have nothing to give the world around us. We wonder why we're not anointed. We wonder why we're struggling so much, why we're fighting a battle in our mind all the time. But when God is taking you through something and when he's developing you, you have to wait. And a lot of times we're okay waiting, but you know how we want to wait? You guys remember Polaroid cameras? Snap it, shake me a few times, Lord, give me a few trials, because I know that you're with me, but develop me and let me see the whole picture within three seconds. That's some of the mentality that we sit here with tonight. So go ahead, Lord, do your work. Give me a trial, give me a struggle, but if you don't get it together in three seconds, I'm out. God does not need to discover you when he has created you. And you and I need to be developed and transformed into his image. And because we do not need to be discovered by God, he will use people and anoint people that we do not think are ready, that we do not think are capable. And we will begin to criticize someone God is using and anointing because we are discovering what God is developing. See, God's the one that's in the dark room with that person. He's in the middle of the process of developing who he sees them to be. Sometimes God is the only one that hears that they're struggling with an addiction. God's the only one that hears sometimes that they're struggling with childhood wounds or their marriage is on the rocks or there's bitterness or anger. We don't hear that. We're not privy to that information because we're not in the dark room. But God is in the dark room with them hearing that. So let me connect this with scripture for for you. We're reading out of 1 Samuel. I have a a handful of verses, so I'm just going to have the reference up behind me. But it's 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'm starting in verse 5. But verses 1 through 4, the Lord is talking to Samuel the prophet. And he's saying, how long are you going to mourn for Saul since I've rejected him as the king? I want you to get up. I want you to go see Jesse in Bethlehem. And and there I will indicate and I will tell you who the one is to be anointed. And, you know, Samuel talks a little bit to the Lord. Now they're going to ask if I'm coming in peace. And said, yes, you come in peace and all that. So we're picking up in verse 5, okay? And I'm just going to read here. Samuel said, yes, in peace, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Verse 8, then Jesse called Abinadab and said, pass him in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse said, then pass Shama, pass, I had Shama pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Verse 10, Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest. Jesse answered, he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Verse 12. So he went for him and brought him in. He was glowing with health and a fine appearance and handsome features. I really want to know how good looking David was because everybody references how amazing he looks, right? I'm like, what? I thought he was handsome. Okay, that's neither there nor there. (laughs) Verse 13, going back into the word of God. So Samuel took the horn of oil. Oh, no, I'm sorry. So he was glowing with a fine appearance and handsome features. The Lord said to rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord powerfully came upon, powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. See, when the prophet came to anoint a new king, the next king, David's own father rejected him. He didn't think he was good enough. He didn't think he could fit the role as king. His father didn't believe in him. His father sent all the other brothers first. You see, all these other brothers had gifts and talents, but David had an anointing. The brothers were strong and they were handsome and they were talented and they were gifted, but David was anointed to be king. And we have so many people doing things for the Lord with their gifts 
And we have to wonder sometimes with so much exposure to Christian music, podcasts, sermons, YouTube channels, social media, how on earth is our world still in so much bondage? How can you come to church bound week in and week out and 20 years later still be bound? That's because we have a whole lot of gifted worship leaders and gifted pastors and gifted speakers, but I'm not sure how many anointed ones we actually have. And let me tell you this morning, there's a really big difference between being gifted and being anointed. See, a gift will fill a room, a gift will move a crowd, a gift will stir people. But Isaiah 10, 27 says it's the anointing that breaks the yokes and chains in your life. Amen. When yokes and chains are breaking, that is the experience that you have freedom in him. It's not just a feeling, it's freedom. That's the difference between being anointed and being gifted. And the only way to be anointed is through crushing. But if we have a generation that doesn't want to be crushed and just berated, then we will continue to have gifted people and not anointed people. So this morning, don't be distracted by somebody's gift and mistake it for anointing. Don't talk about someone God has called and is anointing if all you want to see is gifts and talents. We need a generation that is willing to go into a dark room and to be crushed where the crushing happens. Where you're stripped down and you're broken and you realize that Jesus is the only thing that I need. Jesus is the only thing that I need. See, God is not looking for people to put on display. God wasn't looking for people like David's brothers, but to our standards. And when we read the scripture, they should have been picked. It was a reasonable choice. It was the right choice according to us. But God was looking for David, someone that was willing to be crushed and one day be called a man after God's own heart. God appoints people that we don't see, that we don't think is the right choice. He uses unlikely people, like Moses with a stutter, Esther, a little girl, like you and me with struggles and past. And you and I are by no means a poster child for God's anointing, but he uses unlikely people if you're willing to be crushed. See, you're going to face trials and you're going to face tribulations. The word of God tells us that. And some of us go through a crushing and some of us go through tough times and situation to leave with no anointing. We leave with bitterness and anger and we choose to be a victim of our crushing, not a victor or a survivor of your crushing. But let me tell you this morning, leaving as a victim from your crushing will result in anger. But leaving as a victor from your crushing will result in anointing. And the anointing that you're wanting in your life is in the crushing that you have been avoiding. That's the only way someone gets anointed is through crushing. David was getting an anointed life that day when Samuel came. But his brothers and Jesse, they were looking for an anointed moment. And sometimes we struggle because we feel if we are anointed, there should be instant appointing. David's dad's and dad and brothers wanted the moment of anointing so they could have instant appointing as king. But in our scripture, David is about 15 or 17 years old before he actually reigns as king over Israel. So for about 15 years, that's a long time, God was developing David before he actually placed him in the place he should be when he was anointed as a boy. He was developing him. And I say that to remind yourself, if God anointed you and told you something and it has yet to come to pass, God is developing you. There is a process in which you must go through for his anointing and his appointing time to line up for you. Can I encourage you this morning to be patient? Wait on God. If he called you, he is developing you. 
See, if God puts you here, then God will keep you while you're here. But the minute you start wanting to be discovered and not developed by God, you will miss out on opportunities that you didn't even know exist for you. Somebody hear me this morning because promotion does not come from north, south, east, or west. It comes from God and God alone. And in our day of marketing and berating ourselves, so many of us are missing our destiny. We're missing our anointing. Here's the deal. I'm not necessarily interested, and I say this respectfully, in what you're doing right now. I'm interested in what you're doing in 20, 30 years from now. You see, my testimony didn't start today when I woke up. My testimony started when I was a little girl singing in a kid's choir. When I was 12 years old and at a a major church, I had a lead soloist, which I don't even think I would do that for somebody at 12, but God, they use them. (laughs) All right, room at 16, when I was at a conference, and I remember God speaking to my spirit that one day you will speak and you will sing. I vividly remember that. So my real testimony is that 20 years later, I'm still here. 20 years later, I am doing what God has called me to do. That is the testimony. I'm not interested in now. Where will you be in 20 and 30 years from now? And here's what we have to understand. It's God that chooses. Oh, is that hard to understand and hard to, to receive? It's God that chooses. Samuel verse 1 God's talking to Samuel. He said, you're going to go and you're going to see, and I'm going to tell you the one to anoint. Verses 8 through 10, the Lord has not chosen. 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 God chooses people for certain things. See, we can't all do everything, but you have to do something. Tom Durant didn't choose to be senior pastor of True Vine. God chose him. Mark Waddle didn't choose to be lead pastor of True Vine. God chose him. And sometimes it is better to align with what God has already chosen than to think you should be the next one to be chosen. Sometimes you've got to align up with God it already has in the works than to think, hey, I should be the one doing it. Because let me tell you, it didn't go well for the ones that thought they were to be chosen. Even when the prophet was saying, I know it's this brother and I know it's that brother and it's got to be this one, it's got to be that. And God's saying, I didn't choose them. I didn't want them for this role. I didn't choose them for that. And the thing is, I look at my life, and I'm not naive to think I am not the most talented or the most gifted at what God has called me to do. I know that. People have to think that. People have said that. But you know what I say? I know. I didn't pick me. God chose me. So I know that you're better than me. I know that you're more qualified than me. But if you have an issue, you got to take it up with God because I didn't pick me. God picked me because God is the one that chooses. God chooses. God chooses. And let me tell you this morning, you will never be satisfied unless you are doing what God has called you to do. You to do. You will never be satisfied or fulfilled. And there are so many people in the body of Christ that are full of anxiety and depression and anger and frustration because they're running a race they were never created to run. And you're out of breath on the sidelines and you're trying to keep up and you're struggling because you're created this own race for you and you're not getting sustained from God. They're trying to become who they never were supposed to become rather than staying in the lane that God has created for them. And we oftentimes fool ourselves, well, if I put my blinker on, maybe it's a little nice if I take over. They know I'm coming. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. You're trying to get in someone else's lane and compare yourself and wish you had the anointing of so-and-so and desire the life of someone else and maybe even take it a step further and start tearing down the life of somebody because you don't think they deserve their anointing or their ministry or what they're getting in life. So your body and your ministry and your mind is crumbling because that was not designed for you. That was not your anointing. Can you imagine if David's brothers tried to push David out of the way when Samuel was anointing him and took the anointing and tried to reign as king? They would have been overwhelmed. God wouldn't have been with him. And this is where you have to rest in the sovereignty that God knows best. Oh, does he know best?
The sign of your value and worth as a child of God is not that you become the next best speaker or singer or musician or school teacher or lawyer or doctor or mother and father. It's simply that you become who God has called you to be. I think we, com we, we complex it in our mind and we make it complicated as long as you're becoming who God's called you to be. You're okay. And you can probably sit here and say, you know, I can speak better than that person and I can, I could be a better parent and I could be a better business owner and I could be a better musician and I can be a better this and a better that. But if God didn't choose that for you, and if that's not your assignment, then that means you're looking in the wrong place and God is trying to heal some things inside of your heart until you learn to value everyone's assignment and anointing equally you will struggle until you learn to value everyone's assignment and anointing equally, you will struggle. See, not everyone has the same visibility, but God doesn't place a greater value on any human being. And this is where we have messed up in the world that we live in. We have confused visibility with significance. We have confused visibility with significance. And it's not even in the world that we live in because back in the, the, the scripture with Jesse, he didn't think that David could handle it, that he was significant enough, so he didn't make him visible to the prophet. We have confused visibility with significance. So, oh, if you have a ministry where God's called you to be on a platform and hold a mic, then you really must be called of God. Well, you know what? You can also have a ministry that cleans this house of God on a Thursday at 2 p.m. when nobody else sees what you're doing. That's equal. So David's father didn't see him as a significant option, so he didn't make him visible. But all along, God knew where David was. He knew he was anointed to be king. See, here's the thing that kind of trips me up. God could have told Samuel when he was speaking to him, go to Jesse, ask for David. He's the one. There's a reason. There was a process. He could have told him easily because God knew it's David that I'm looking for, but he didn't. He said, go and I'll tell you when you get there. And the side of David being anointed, there was a reason he had the prophet Jesse and the brothers go through the process of not only being picked, but watching the anointing happen of David. <laughs> Verse 13 says, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in, anointed him in the presence of his brothers. Let me tell you something some, this morning. God will raise you up in front of people that want your spot. God will take care of that for you. He will raise you up and anoint you in front of people that want your anointing. Because God anoints those that we don't think are significant for the role. But God always chooses. And I'm just going to throw this out there. God is not obligated to sustain anything he did not start. So you get out there with your gifts and your talent and you, you get all these accolades for being the best COO and getting, you know, hey, you're a great speaker, you're a great singer. You, know, you get discovered by your gifts or your talents or, hey, man, you really know real estate, you know all these things. If God was never in it to begin with, do not expect him to sustain it and bless what you're doing when he's never started it. So I just want to encourage you, put God at the forefront of it. Before you make the decision, before you go into the career, before you go to the college, before you step into any relationship, if he's not starting it, he will not sustain it. And that was free, okay? But here's the thing about David. He was out tending sheep, minding his business, all while his house was going through a whole thing. All while the prophet was trying to go through the brothers and Jesse was going, what about this one? What about this one? What about this one? David was tending sheep. He missed all of that because he was right where he was supposed to be in the presence of God and he was with God and communicating with God and he was feeling fulfilled. If he had heard all that commotion and seen all that rejection and that his name was never coming up and it was going through all the brothers, do you think he would have been confident enough to be king? He would have been thinking, my dad doesn't believe in me. The man of God didn't even pick me. My brothers were all ahead of me. So here's my point. When you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and you're spending time with God 
and you're worshiping God and you're focusing on your life and what God is doing in you, he will open up doors for you and place you in positions that he wants for you. When you're staying connected to him and not wandering off into somebody's lane and not trying to figure out all these different things in your life. See, the prophet was trying to pick what was obvious to him. The brothers looked obvious. They were tall, dark, and handsome. It was obvious that God had called them. It was obvious that God was going to anoint them. And oftentimes we miss the anointed one because we're looking at the obvious. Samuel showed up that day and he was looking for the next Saul. Who's someone that looks like Saul? Who's someone that acts like Saul? Who's someone that carries themselves like Saul? Who is the next one? But God never said, I'll raise up a next king. He wanted to raise up a new king. Some of us are missing our anointing and our destiny because we are taking, trying to be the next so-and-so, trying to be the next Tom Durance or the Mark Waddle or Ashley Waddle or Mary Savage, anybody trying to be the next person. But I've come to tell you this morning, that is what Hollywood does. Who is the next American Idol? Who is the next great singer? Who is the next George Clooney? Who is the next Justin Bieber? Just bring them on through so we can let the world know that they're here. God doesn't work that way. He doesn't do the next anything. He does a brand new thing so that you can have a new way of life and a new anointing. Behold, old things are passed away and all things are new. He does a new thing, not a next thing. I just want you to know I'm preaching better than you're leading on. I want to touch a little bit about verse 7 where God tells Samuel he looks at the heart, not the outward appearance. Scripture does tell us that he was handsome. He was good looking. So work with what you got, okay? God bless you. Work with it. But the truth is God always looks at the, from the inside out, which is why, church, we are shocked when he uses people he uses. But every issue of life comes from the heart, Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. What is in you eventually will come out of you one way or another. See, your heart will determine how far you go in life. It's your heart that gets tired when you're doing good. It's your heart that gets overwhelmed. Your heart is the source of your life. And God says, if I take you back here, will you do this for me because you love me? When nobody is looking when you're not getting applauded, when you're not getting and you're unappreciated and you're unrecognized and you're uninvited, would you do it when nobody knows what's going on? Because if you can't learn to do it for me back here when you're unapplauded, unrecognized, uninvited, if you can't do it then, you have no way of sustaining it when you are getting invited and applauded and recognized. Somebody hear me today. If you're going to go back here and when nobody sees what you're doing, and you're not getting the invite, and you're not getting the accolades and the recognition, if you can't do it right here, you will never be able to do it right here when all those things are happening and sustain it in your life. Do it simply because you love God and for nothing else. And don't worry about being liked if you're not trying to be like God. When your heart is trying to be like God, he will put you in rooms you shouldn't be in. He will give you favor you can orchestrate. He will give you opportunities that you know you did not earn. See, we all love that and it sounds good and we clap to it. But what is your heart saying? Is your heart saying this morning for man to discover me or God develop me? And here's the scary thing. We will always seek from man what we fear God will not give you. You will always seek from man what you fear God will not give you. Acceptance, love, purpose, opportunities, affirmation, attention. What are you seeking from man right now in your life that you should be seeking from God, but you're afraid that it won't come? See, in the dark room where you're being developed is when you realize that the presence of God and his anointing That's all you need to be satisfied. When we went to Brazil and we were able to see the church, it was small. It was hot. Trying to stay focused just to worship, I was like, dear Lord. But there was a difference because Jesus was not their last option. He was their first. 
And us Americans have tried all of our resources, prayed all the prayers, tapped into everything that we possibly can, and they say, well, all I have to do is pray. No, you should have started with that, my friend. Jesus is our last option in America. But in Brazil, they reverenced the name of Jesus. They knew he was the only option. If he doesn't heal my body, I don't have money to go to the doctor. If he doesn't touch my marriage, I don't have funds to go for counseling. He's my only option. And here's the thing about David and his anointing. He was anointed, and then he went back to work. He went back to tend sheep. He had to bring his lunch, his brother's lunches after he was anointed. See, before he was king, he was a servant. He got anointed, and he served. So even though God has called you and anointed you, you better know that during that anointing, you will serve people before during and after you reach your full potential that God has for you. You must be a servant before you can be a king. You better be willing to serve someone before someone can serve you. Amen? David did so many things after his anointing, and one of those things was he played for the current king Saul in about Samuel 16, about verse 14. David went in to play the harp for Saul, and he was learning the process of the palace. David was a shepherd boy. He didn't know palace protocols. He didn't know what it was going to take to be anointed as king. He didn't know how to run a kingdom. He didn't know, even know what a palace looked like. So God brought him into a place for Paul so he could see how a palace would run, so he could see the culture and the lifestyle of a king. See, there's a process to your anointing. There's a process to the person's anointing that you think isn't qualified. David wasn't qualified, but God chose him. God put him in a place to learn the protocols so that one day he would reign as king. He had to grow into what God had for him. He had to rub shoulders with the current king. He had to see how he was interacting with the people of Israel, the demands of the king, how he dealt with the staff because he didn't know a palace. So God placed him in a position to grow. Musicians, you can come. God has anointed you and people will say and think that you're not ready. But God will put you in places and circumstances so that you can grow into your anointing just like David. And some of us are walking in our anointing today. We have taken the role and the place that God saw for us when he anointed us. And for those individuals, hear me for a moment. Because you are in your God-ordained anointed role, please keep your heart and motives pure. See, this morning, I'm not just talking about kingdom work. I'm talking about your job and the position that you hold there. I'm talking about being the leader of your home or being the mother that God's called you to be or being the friend that God's called you to be with pure motives. If you're walking in your God-fulfilled role, stay humble. Stay pure. Because we see David falling into immorality when he was king. He was already anointed. He was already in the position God saw for him, and he messed up. And this is a side note. Just because you are in the place of your leadership or your calling and living out your God-ordained anointing does not mean you get to treat people with disrespect. You don't get to say, all I need is God's approval, and man's approval doesn't matter. That's true, but that doesn't mean you get to treat man with disrespect. And I'm not just talking kingdom work. I'm talking at your home. How are you speaking to your spouse and your children and your loved ones? You need only man's, uh, God's approval, but you don't get to treat man how you want. Remember, everybody's calling is equal to the Lord. For those that are anointed, but you are in the process of God developing you into your assignment. Some of you sit here today and you're wondering if you actually are called and anointed to do this or that. Or if your calling or anointing that you felt so many years ago was actually God because nothing has come to fruition. Or you wonder, have I made too many wrong decisions that I've messed up my anointing? If God assigns you, he will find you. Rest assured, if God assigned you, he will find you. David's brothers probably were mad that they didn't get picked that day. 
They probably made fun of him for being chosen and then nothing happening, him going straight back to tending sheep and then him having to serve them. And knowing siblings, they, I'm sure, oh, here comes King David with our lunch, King David. I have two little kids, okay? I'm sure if they got that opportunity, they would do it. So knowing siblings, they probably teased him a little bit, made fun of him. Oh, you were the one that got picked and look at your life. You're still out here. I'm the one going to war and you're the one out tending sheep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But you know what David did? He didn't go anywhere. He stayed close to God and whatever God asked him to do, he did it with all his heart. You just got to stay in place. And just like David, when Samuel told Jesse, go and get David, go and get him. And we will stand and wait until he comes. God will have people stand up and wait for you. And those that have tried to kick you out will be the ones opening the door so that you can walk on through with your anointing because it has now become your appointed time. You just got to stay in place. You just got to stay faithful. You got to allow God to develop you and not get out of the purpose that he has for your life. God wants to develop you, not discover you. And whatever you're doing in your life, you need God to anoint you to do it. Could you stand today? If you want to be a generation where God can develop you, if you want God to take you into a dark room, you want to tell God, I'm tired of opening the doors. I'm tired of pulling the blinds up so that light comes in and I get so far in my walk with God and then I take it into my own hands and I begin to unlock the door and let light in. If you're tired of doing that and you want to go into a dark room and keep it dark where God could rid you of some things and he can change the way that you process things. He can change some things in your life. He can forgive you of some things. And you want him to develop you into who he saw you to be years ago in your mother's womb. To develop you so that you can walk in your anointing. I want you to come. Come just because you're in love with him and you want to be like him. Come because you realize that he's the only thing that can satisfy your soul. Come because you want to taste and see that he's good. Come because you know you are called and anointed. Come because you want to keep your anointing pure. Come and get developed by God, not discovered. Come because you might be a little scared with your anointing and you need God to help you navigate it. Just come and be in his presence. These altars are open. I'm going to pray. And if you feel God calling you into a dark room, I want you to take the step of faith. God, we call on your name today as you are speaking to people all throughout this congregation. God, give them the strength and the courage to step forward and to step into their anointing. They are called and they are anointed, God. Whether they're in the process of being developed, God, or whether they need to keep their anointing pure, we need your presence. We need your presence. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. We want to thank you for joining us today and believe with you that God has spoken to you through the word and worship. If you decided today that you would like to give your life to God or recommit it to Him, we'd love to connect with you, pray with you, and be here with you, strengthening your relationship with Jesus Christ. Whether that be through a Bible study, baptism in Jesus' name, or striving to receive the infilling of the Spirit. We want to connect with you, see the amazing things that God is doing and is going to do in your life. Visit us at truevine.live and become a part of what God is doing at Truevine, what He's going to continue to do in your life.